Hello everybody and I am Keaton. This is Kinetic Catholic Ministry Season 14 Episode 8. I hope that you are having a great Tuesday, great kind of start to your Lent so far. Um, and again, the video on Lent was last week if you want to go check that out. But today we're doing something a little bit different again. Um, moving into Kinetic, we're kind of uh, welcoming more people on board, trying to hear from, from different people each week rather than just myself. Um, and so here we have uh, Braden Eckert, who is very much involved in the pro-life movement. Braden and I um, connected because we will be going to uh, college together in the fall, um, which is pretty, pretty exciting. But Braden, thank you so much for agreeing to come on, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. So, um, Braden, again, like I mentioned, very involved in the pro-life movement. And I think that it's good that we're hearing from, um, young people. Like I mentioned, we're going, we're going to college together. So we're in the same grade, um, to hear more young people, um, who are kind of involved in, in different elements, um, of, of activism and, and stuff that matters. So Braden just kind of started off to kind of start off, um, the interview. When did you start becoming like so involved in the pro-life movement? What kind of prompted um, um, this involvement? Yeah, thank you again. Um, I've just kind of, I've grown up in a Christian household. So I've always just been, you know, taught to value and uh, respect human life. But the concept of abortion was really never talked about in my household. Because there was something that was brought up. It was just kind of like, I didn't even know what abortion was until like, I think seventh or eighth grade, or I'd never even heard of it. But um, when the movie Unplanned came out, I went and saw it in theaters with my family. And then um, just sitting there in the movie, I got a deep sense of conviction because I realized that um, I very well could have been aborted if my mother had chosen differently. And I became overwhelmed with a deep sense of gratitude and a deep sense of um almost hurt because it was like, while I was grateful for my life, I also knew so there are people in similar situations to mine who do not get that right to life. And so it convicted me very heavily. And so I went home that night and I literally just looked up like right to life, pro-life, anything near me. And then I was just like, how do I get involved? And emailing all these people being like, you know, like, what can I do to get involved? Because I realized that this is a pressing issue and that daily people are being killed for it. Right. So would you say that that kind of like, like your past and your experience with the, with the movie Unplanned, would you say that that is kind of what um, like fuels your passion for um, like, like the pro-life movement as a whole? Yeah, I would say that fuels it a lot, but also um, just my story in general of uh, being in foster care and suffering a lot of abuse. And like uh, when my mother was about to give birth to me, the doctors encouraged her multiple times that you know, because of different medical disabilities Brayden has, it would not be the gracious thing to give him life. He should just terminate the pregnancy. And my mom said no, because she had always held out hope for a son. And so she just was like, I really want to have this baby boy and I'll love him until he dies. And so my mother really had a lot of passion in her heart to give life to me. And even though God saw a different plan for my life, it's still very beautiful. So... Do you mind like like as much or as little as you, as you um, are willing to share? Kind of what is your your story, your background? Um, because I I understand that you have um, shared it on social media and it's garnered a, a lot of support um, um, for you and and kind of for the the life movement as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened was um, so back in two thousand four at the beginning of the year, um, my biological mother was living in uh, Colorado. She was uh, severely addicted to drugs and alcohol in and out of a lot of abusive relationships. And um, she just was really had hit a rock bottom point in her life. And so it just became uh, really difficult for my family around her to watch her go through this. And so uh, it ended up that she was pregnant and it was kind of, I was unexpected. My, her pregnancy with me was not something that was planned at all. But she was grateful. Um, and so just as the pregnancy went along, um, different things happened in her life that just kind of made her addictions more extreme and worse into where she was uh, just very heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol and really killing her body from the inside out and in so damaging my development. And so because of this, the doctors were just like, you know, all of the stuff that you've been putting into your body is killing your child. And so 
this child will be born with tons of birth defects. This child probably won't even be born at the rate you're going at. So you might as well just abort. My mother was like, I just, I can't do that. Um, and I'm unaware of this. My mother had abortions or not, but my mother's conviction of not wanting to abort was something that really fuels me. And so after I was born, um, my mother was still really struggling to make ends meet. We were homeless at the time and with my sisters. And so what happened was uh, we, <clears throat> one day I was just, you know, at my mom's house just playing and my grandma came over and she noticed that there is a ton of uh, methamphetamines and just different drugs all around the apartment. And my grandma was very mad at my mom and she yelled at her and she's just like, you know, like, how are you doing this? How can you raise a kid like this? This is not humane. Like, why would you do this? And my mom was like, I love my children and I don't want to get rid of them. And so my grandma kind of let it slide. And my grandma was like, well, I'll come watch the kids. You do whatever you do, but I will make sure that they have a food and uh, clothing. And so what happened was after a couple of weeks, my grandma came one time over and saw me there. And when she opened the door, I was carrying around a heroin needle. And that was just kind of in her mind, like, I can't let this keep happening. This is dangerous. And so she made the tough decision as a grandmother to call CPS and had them come and remove me and my sister, Bridget. And so it was just one of those things where it took a lot of strength for her to do that, but she knew deep down inside it was the right thing to do. And so, I was immediately, me and my sister Bridget were immediately put into foster care together. And eventually we uh, joined up with our half sisters. And it was just, we were in and out of a lot of abusive homes, um, multiple homes, all of us were physically and sexually assaulted and uh, starved and just not properly cared for. And the foster system, for people who don't understand foster system, the goal is to reunif uh, reunify the child with their parents down the road, but giving those parents a break away from their children to get the help that they need. But what was happening in foster care was our situation was just increasingly worse. And so when my two older half sisters reached the age of emancipation, they left the system and they said, we'll just be homeless on the street because we don't want anything to do with this because of how badly they have been hurt. But me and my sister Bridget had, didn't have that option because we were so young. And so eventually um, Bridget's dad, who we later found out was also my father, um, made the decision that he wanted to adopt Bridget out of the system. But at the time there was no record saying that he was my dad and so he could not take me legally. And so what happened was I was alone in foster care um, and it was it was very difficult. I mean, I was only a couple months old and I'd already been through so much. And so what happened was my I was placed in this one home. Uh, it would be my last foster home. And that was the home that I really experienced the most abuse in. Um, the lady who would take care of me, I slept on the floor, uh, had no crib, no bottle feeding. I ate Vienna sausages and Fruit Loops and I was not getting proper nutrition. I uh, actually was severely underweight to the point where my body was so deficit of the proper nutrients that I began protruding out of my stomach and my hair turned orange. And it was just one of those things where like, I was so sick and I was covered in sores and just really suffering. And then one day these two, uh, these two people got a letter in the mail saying that a child near them needed a home to go to for fostering. And they had just signed on with the foster care system. And they were like, oh, this child just looks adorable. He's so sweet, has a big smile. Like we just, we feel like we need to visit this child. So they go to the lady's house, which is the house that I'm at. And uh, immediately when they enter the door, uh, my now father says that I just ran up to him and I said, Dada, and that just was like, that sold them. They were like, you know, like, okay, yeah, we can't leave him here. He has to go home with us. And so they began doing visits weekly and um, our relationship really connected. And they finally were able to get 
uh, the court to allow them to adopt me out of the system. And it was just a very special thing because their adopting me saved me from what could be many, many more years of abuse and suffering. And so the reason that like my whole story inspires me as a pro-life activist is because so many times um, I hear people say, well, why would you want that child to end up in suffering or to potentially end up in foster care? And my whole motto in the pro-life movement is my abuse is not your excuse. And I say, I think it's wrong to tokenize my abuse, my suffering, the things that I had to go through that you never had to experience to say it's okay to dehumanize and kill other people in that name. And so my whole passion is fueled by um, ending dehumanization and bringing a more, a culture that respects life. And so that's really just what fuels me. That's awesome. So so that, that story, kind of that, that motivation, um, it shows in like how active you are um, in, in the pro-life movement and how much you are willing to do. Mm -hmm. it's very clear that like I think kind of widespread for our generation it's not like what you're doing um, and being that that actively pro-life it's not the most popular thing by any means and so um, there are there are a lot of um, kids our age and even younger who are kind of afraid to 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 say something afraid to really speak out about it do you have a piece of advice or, or rather what would you say to um, maybe a young person who really struggles to to defend life, who's who's fearful fearful for how they might be seen or, or how they might be ridiculed for it. Is there kind of a way to to address that and be willing to to defend life regardless? Yeah, um, for me, I just find a lot of peace and comfort knowing that I'm on the side of truth and that you know being pro life is more than just being against abortion. It's for so many other things it's being you know pro rehumanization it's pro like helping women it, there's so many other issues and i i like to remind people that really struggle with saying like i'm pro-life like we're not just anti-abortion we're pro-life like we have so many other things about us that make us such a unique movement that make us want to help people because uh, the other side looks at a woman in an unplanned pregnancy and they say we will do everything in our way to not help you, but just get the problem fixed. Right. And we say we will do everything in our care to help you where there doesn't have to be that fix. And so it's just one of those things where I remind people, like, even if it might not be the most like hip or trendy thing to say, like, oh, I'm anti-abortion, like children are dying. And I think that reality um, glazes over a lot of active pro-lifers' minds is the fact that children are dying. And we can bounce around all the cute language and all the, you know, like, love them both and such, which is very important, but also we have to remember the reality of abortion and the reality that human beings are being stripped away of their right to life. Right. So, so... So beyond that, for for a young person, like be involved with it. Um, maybe mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't who doesn't have much of a platform or doesn't really know where to start. What are some practical things that that a young person or really anybody can do to um, be be involved in the pro life movement to defend life? Like, what are some practical ways that we may be able to help? Mm -hmm. Well, there are many like active organizations that exist specifically to engage young people. An organization I've uh, volunteered with in the past is Students for Life. Um, they do a lot to educate young people on the reality of abortion, especially on college campuses. And it's just one of those things where uh, it's necessary that young people get more involved. Um, but I, I think it's really important to kind of figure out what your strengths are as an individual, because like what I really enjoy doing, I'm good at confrontation. I I, I enjoy confrontation, but not, that's not for everyone. Like I enjoy counter protesting. I find a lot of joy in it because I know that I'm standing for truth actively, but that's not for everyone and it shouldn't be expected for everyone. Right. And so I have certain friends who, you know, they're pro-life and they do a lot of work for the movement, but their work kind of goes unrewarded because they just aren't as uh vocal about it in their schools and that's okay you don't have to be like 
wearing all this pro-life merch every day to school and you know like having people yelling at you all around like you don't have to be that you can be a normal human being and be pro-life right and so i think it's really important to figure out what your strengths are where your heart is too because for some people they are against abortion but they have a really big heart for helping women in crisis pregnancies and so i think that that's so important is to find those organizations who spe- specifically focus on that to get involved and say like how can i help you know most organizations on their websites will have a place that says reach out to us contact us reach out say hey i'm a young person um new to the movement and then you know to see what happens from there you know like god is powerful and god can use anyone to do any of his wills and so another thing i would say a uh, big thing in our generation is social media and you know, making pro-life content, talking about, hey, here's the reality of abortion. If you have a story like mine, uh, where you have been personally impacted by the reality of abortion or the reality of its arguments, um, I think it's important to share those stories and to platform yourself where people see, oh, not all pro-lifers are the same. Because I get a lot of people who love to have me speak because, you know, I don't fit the general stereotype of the media of a pro-lifer. I'm not an old crusty old white Republican male. Like, you know, I'm a person of color, I'm a student, I'm not, I don't consider myself a conservative or a Republican. And so it's just one of those things where, you know, find your niche within the movement and then go from there. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much, Brayden. I will link um, Students for Life in, in the description down below, and then um, kind of kind of Brayden story exactly what he said being able to platform yourself and use social media um for for good um because it absolutely can be thank you again brayden um for for coming on for being willing to to share your story so openly um and so passionately uh we we really appreciate it of course so um again thank thank you guys for watching because it's a little bit of a different video again with an interview we're not going to have a saint of the week this week um but uh, again, being able to get involved in the pro-life movement as much or, or, or as little as you are able. And just as Braden mentioned, with all of our kind of different strengths um, in order to defend uh, the right to life and, and prevent the, the, the mass slaughter that we see uh, going on in our world. So thank you all so much for watching. Um, please subscribe. I'll see you all next week.